I want to welcome you to a very special Christmas Eve service. Come on, can we just welcome all those that are joining us live? So excited to have you guys with us. I want to talk to you today about what's so special about Christmas. Now, before I get into the message, I want to just ask a couple questions. I want to talk about traditions. I know we all have Christmas traditions. I love this time of the year. Absolutely love every bit about it. So I'm just going to just roll out a couple things to see if you guys connect. All right, so here it is. How many of you guys, uh, how many of you, whether you have kids in the home or when you did have them in the home, would pile everybody in the car Pray for it to be less than 75 degrees. Get hot chocolate and go see Christmas lights. Anybody here? Yeah, wasn't that fun, right? That's when you discovered Benadryl for your children. How are the lights? I don't know. They can't see, but we're having a good time, honey. Isn't that right? Okay, how about this one? How, how many of you, now you got to be honest, you're in church. How many of you get all of your Christmas shopping done the day after Thanksgiving? Anybody? Raise your hand. We're praying for you. It's a little OCD, but anyway, so that's a, I know it's cheap that day. So, so, okay, here, here's another, one. here's another. One. I know we have purists in the house that only open presents on Christmas morning. And that's wonderful. How many of you guys are Christmas Eve present opener people? Anybody? Okay. Look, 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 look. How many of you are Christmas Eve, Eve openers? I have an eight-year-old. She's like, Dad, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, last one, Christmas trees. Love Christmas trees. A number of years ago, uh, when our kids were little, my, my, my wife and I, uh, I thought to myself, I had this bright eye idea. I saw that you could actually go and chop down your own Christmas tree. I thought, this is going to be awesome. We got about halfway there. I thought, this is dumb. <laughs> we pulled over. I said, honey, let's just get one of these. I mean, that was a real Christmas tree. All right, we got a real Christmas tree, but I didn't chop it down. And so we got it, we did the lights, and we bought all the lights, and this is years ago. And about three days later, putting the lights up, took me about three days. Anyway, so about three days later, putting the, I thought, that was a lot of work. So the following year, we thought, you know what? Again, I say it respectfully, but, but because it shedded. I mean, it was just like, well, we had an Alaska Samoyed. There was as much tree stuff on the ground as dog hair. So we thought, we're going to get an artificial tree. I know it's artificial, but we'll still put the lights up. We did that for a year. Then we had the thought, we're going to get the artificial tree and buy the thing that you put the lights on all year long. And we thought, this is amazing. We put the lights on the tree. You take it down. You put it in the attic. You don't even have to break the tree down. This is awesome. Now what we do is we have the artificial tree with the lights, and we just stick it in the corner, you know, in January and put a blanket over it. Come on. How many of y'all know we are progressing? We are. I'm just joking. We do do number three. We do do number three. It's fun to have Christmas traditions. We all have them. We have wonderful Christmas traditions. It's interesting when you think about Christmas. What's so special about Christmas? Tomorrow, tomorrow there, there are going to be businesses that will be closed down. Most all business will be closed down. I mean, the fact of the matter is stores will be closed down, restaurants will be closed down. <clears throat> of course, the federal government closed down last week, so, but anyway, so <laughs> that's not in my notes. You know that's funny, you know that's funny. The interstate will not have a lot of traffic. Why? Why is that? I had a conversation with an, I said this respectfully, I know there's all different types of people that come to our church, atheists, agnostics, people that have been saved for a long time, <clears throat> different backgrounds, and so, and we're honored to have them here every week. We're honored, some of you guys maybe even checking out Christianity, we're, I really mean that, we're honored that you're our guests. But I'll never forget having a conversation with this guy who was an atheist. And in the conversation, he was trying to talk to me. He said, you know, about Jesus, and I don't know about all this whole Jesus thing. And I, and I just stopped right in the middle of it. I had this thought. I thought, what year is it? I think it was like 1995. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you guys at all of our campuses, okay, so in, let's see, it's December 24th, so in what? Six, seven days, would that be? What, what? So in seven days, what year will it be? 2000 and what? Everybody say it. Okay, I went through that with that guy. It was like 1995. And I said, 2019 years since when? 
Since the birth of a person who you think is just a good religious teacher? There's a lot of good religious teachers out there. But are you talking about all of the timeline of, of, of civilization the last, what, 2,000 years that we're all basing it on the birth of somebody that was just, yeah, he's a pretty good teacher? There was something so unique about Christ. It's interesting, I was thinking about Jesus. I was thinking about this, actually, this, this weekend and this Christmas Eve service. And I thought to myself, I thought to myself, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you for about 14, 15 minutes, that's it. And then we're gonna have, by the way, at the end, it's gonna be a wonderful time of candle lighting and you don't wanna leave for that. And, but I wanna talk to you about what really is so special about Christmas, why? What is the why behind the what? Why did thousands, millions, millions and millions of people all over the world, what is so special? Is it just human tradition? Or is there something that is supernatural and unique and divine? I want to talk to you about the relevance of Christmas. I want to talk to you about the reasons for Christmas. Then I want to end up talking about the reality of what Christmas means to me on a daily basis. Number one, the relevance of Christmas, the relevance of Christmas. Hey, if I could sum it up in one word, here's the one word. You guys ready? Here it is. Here it is. Why is Christmas so relevant to the earth, to us? One, one statement. Let me say it that way. It's because on that very first Christmas, here it is. God came to earth. God came to earth. And when you understand that God came to earth. Now, now, we are what's called Trinitarians. We believe there's one God. Everybody say one God. Okay, but God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's not three gods. That's one God, three distinct persons, all right? So, so we believe in one God. And, and, and when God came to earth, let me tell you, that was huge. I tell you, it was really cool in our last service. Uh, we have Mr. Lee Bubrick, who is who's in his 90s, who is a World War II veteran. And we've got a couple World War II veterans uh, in our church, which is awesome. And I love World War II history. I tell you what's really cool. We have the World War II Museum. Does anybody know what the name of the World War II Museum in New Orleans was before the World War II Museum? It was the D-Day Museum. Remember what happened on D-Day, right? All the history people, what happened? The Allied forces, what did they invade? What was it? Normandy. That was a big day. That was a huge day for the United States. Let me tell you a bigger day. Not when the Allied forces invaded Normandy, but when God invaded the earth. That was a bigger day. Hey, listen to this. I'll never forget that, uh, hearing about and reading about as a kid that huge day for humanity, not just for the United States, but globally speaking, when Neil Armstrong did what? He walked on the what? Say it, the moon. That was a big day. Let me tell you, a bigger day is when Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, walked on the earth. Now, I'm going to say about four statements throughout this message that I'm going to just push you just a little bit. And I want you to think about it. Here's one. You ready for this? When Je Don't miss this. When Jesus Christ was born 2,000 years ago, that's not, quote, when he, let me say this. That's not when he came alive. When Jesus Christ was born 2,000 years ago, let me tell you. That's when Christ came to the earth. But how many know that Jesus always existed? Oh, pastor, this is kind of radical. I never heard this before. I mean, I thought he was born as a baby. Now, remember, he chose to come to the earth as a baby. Do you remember Adam? When Adam was placed in the garden, he, let me tell you, Adam wasn't, he didn't come as a baby, but God placed him as a mature man. You see, you have to understand who Christ is. Look what it says in Colossians chapter 1. This is so important. God came to earth. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He existed before God made anything at all. He wasn't created. You know, we're, we're created, right? What takes place, and then in our mother's womb, we grow and all that, and then we, we come. Let me tell you something. Jesus, the Bible says, he existed before God made anything. In fact, Christ himself is the creator who made everything. And so in other words, Christ is God. The fact is he chose to come to the earth as a baby. And I have no idea why Bethlehem it wasn't Jerusalem, the city of commerce. I mean, Jerusalem was kind of the big city, the happening place. It comes to Bethlehem. 
I mean, why would he come to a little city outside of the big city? You know, nobody sees anything. There's no fanfare. There's no ticker tape parade. There's no anything. I mean, be honest. If I was the event planner, I would have, I would have planned it differently. I mean, I would have made sure more people are watching. Okay, well, let me tell you when I would have planned it. Y'all ready for this? I mean, because I'm looking for a big bang, right? I mean, I want the whole thing. I want as many people to see it as possible. I would have planned Christ coming at halftime at the Super Bowl in Atlanta in February when the Saints are playing whoever dares. I mean, come on. If you want to see the whole world, see, I mean, you're going to plan it right there. Bethlehem, what? Doesn't even make sense. And a baby, God comes as a baby. I often thought about why, why? And then I had this thought. Here's the deal about babies, you ready for this? Babies don't scare anybody. Everybody loves a baby. There was a lot of weird thoughts about God back then. There's a lot of weird thoughts about God today. God just up there, kind of ticked off. You woke him up on a Sunday nap, ready to knock you out, just take you out. And yet, when you open the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when I see who Christ is, he's trying to help people, not hurt people. He's trying to bless people and forgive people, not put things on people, take things off of people. The fact of the matter is that Christ came. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you why. God came to earth as a baby. Watch this, because he wanted to grow up as a human, fully God, but fully man. It's called the hypostatic union, theologically. Fully God, but fully man. Don't miss this. He wanted to experience all the things that you and I experience. He wanted to experience all the rejections. He wanted to experience all the pain. He wanted to experience everything. Why? So that you and I never say, you know what? God, you can't relate. That's not true. That's not true at all. Fact is, he can relate big time. I said, he came down into the human realm. I love what Philippians says. He became like men and was born a human being. He understands. He understands when you hurt. He understands betrayal. He understands when you're close to some friends, then they stab you in the back, literally. He connects, man. He connects with everything. He understands how to forgive father what? Say it. Forgive them for they know. He knows. When you serve Christ, you don't serve a God that doesn't connect. I'll never forget, I heard this story about um, this grandpa who loved his grandson, loved him. Now, I want to say a couple statements. I have four children. I don't, I'm not a grandfather yet. I like to be at the appropriate time, and I, that's cool. And, and, but, and, and, and so I, I didn't say this statement. Robert Morris, who's a great preacher in Dallas, Texas, and Gateway Church, he said this. He preached here last year. He said this. I didn't say it. He said this. He said that grandkids are better than your kids. I didn't say it. He said that grandkids are actually a reward for not killing your kids. <laughs> I didn't say that. He said that. Okay? I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. So there's this granddad who just absolutely loved his grandson. And they were at Christmas and they were over. At the granddad was over at his daughter's house. And his daughter had little Jeffrey. And so they put out a little playpen in the middle and Mom wanted to make sure that Jeffrey was able to crash and sleep and all this and because she knew it was going to be a big day. So she put the playpen right in the middle. And of course, granddad had, and I heard this about grand, I mean, you love all your grandkids, but sometimes you have this little special connection with some of them. You know, maybe there's one, it's just, there's just a little connection. But he had a big time connection with Jeffrey. So, so they're talking back and forth. And so granddad hears out of the kitchen, dad, dad, leave Jeffrey alone. Jeffrey, you know better than that. Lay down. Go to sleep, Jeffrey. Little Jeffrey had little crocodile tears. Just kind of welled up. He looked at granddad like that. And granddad just looked at Jeffrey and he thought, <laughs> then he had an idea. Mama said, your mama said that I can't take you out. But your mama never said that I can't get in there with you. <laughs> you know, that's really a picture of the incarnation. 
is that God never took us out, but God stepped down into our human dilemma and our fears and our rejections and our hurts and our dreams and our pains. Why? Because God became like one of us because God can relate to us. How many of y'all are grateful that God knows? God knows. Christmas is relevant because God became man. For some of you guys, just to be honest, this is a tough time of the year. It's a tough time of the year because it's maybe the first time that you've experienced the holiday season, Christmas time, without that special love on maybe a mom that passed away or a dad and you gather together at one of the sister's houses or somebody's house and maybe it was a child. And so now you're like, man, pastor, you know, I, I, I want to be excited, but, but there's a certain sense of loss. Again, I want to say this, God understands. Let me, let me give you the second thing about why, why is Christmas so important? Number one, the relevance of Christmas is God came to earth. Number two, the reason for Christmas. What, what, what are some of the reasons for Christmas? Stay with me. Well, it's for your benefit. It's for my benefit. God came to earth for our benefit. Number one, to show us what God, listen, Jesus came. Remember, he is God. He came to earth to show us what God is like. Now, let me tell you, I'm gonna pre I appreciate nature, I appreciate the mountains, I appreciate the, the ocean, I appreciate all that. When you look at the mountains, you see the majestic power of God. When you, when you look out there and you understand nature, you see God is highly organized, isn't he? You look at a sunset or a sunrise. I was actually in the woods recently, and I, did, I was with, with a buddy, I said, look, at that is amazing. It was kind of pink. I was like, that is awesome. That sp speaks of the creativity of God. God is awesome and God is powerful and God is creative, but the problem with nature is nature doesn't show us a full picture of God. See, when you look in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, let me tell you what Jesus shows us about God. Jesus shows us that God is not just organized, but he's also loving. When we see who Christ is, we see that, that Jesus loved, listen, he loved the up and outers and the down and outers. He loved those that were popular and he loved those that were on the fringes. Jesus loves people. We learned that. We learned that God loves you. Number two, we also learned that, let me tell you, we learned that God forgives. Nature can't forgive you, but Christ forgives you. That means everything you've ever done, every sin that you've ever committed, we find when we see this Bible. Remember the woman that was caught in that sin pattern? What did Christ say to her? What did he say? You're worthless. You should have known better. No, what did he do? He freed her from her sin and then said, go and sin no more. So we learn from Christ what God is like. There are a lot of crazy thoughts out there about God. Guys, I'm talking about in culture today. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you get a picture of who God is, let me, when you see Jesus Christ, how he healed people, didn't hurt people, how he blessed people, didn't burden people, wow. Let me tell you, when we understand who Christ is, number one, the relevance of Christmas is that God came to earth. Number two, the reason for Christmas is, 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 is that Christ came to earth to show us who God the Father really is, to show us what God is like. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you another one. Here's my second push statement. You ready for this? Jesus came to earth to show us what life is really about. All right, here's my statement. Everybody's existing. Very few people are really living. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you're taking up airspace, you're occupying your little space, but are you really living to fulfill God's plan and purpose for your life? I remember what my life was like before I became a Christian, before I knew Christ. And, and I mean, I was such, I mean, on the outside, I was just kind of going through the motions. How many millions and millions of people, they're just going through the motions, and yet when you come to Christ, it's like he's the manufacturer, we're the product, he knows how life ticks and works best. There's an emptiness in the heart of every single one of you that don't know God, and I say that respectfully. St. Augustine said it this way, St. Augustine, however you want to pronounce it. He said, our hearts, listen, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Ecclesiastes says that God has put in our hearts eternity. In other words, we can try to fulfill all of those things. We can try to get as much success or much things or much stuff, but nothing can meet the need that only God can meet on the inside. That's why Jesus in John 10, 10 says this about life. He says, I've come that you may have life. I've come that you may have life, but it didn't stop there and have it to the full. 
That your life can be transformed. That you can experience the joy of Christ, the peace of Christ. That's why he came. Jesus came to earth to show us what God is like. Jesus came to earth to demonstrate the love of God, the forgiveness of God. Why did he do it? He didn't have to. He didn't have to do it. Christ didn't have to come, but he did. You, know, you want to know why? Because he loves you. Sir, let me just tell you, he loves you. Every single one of you guys, every one of you ladies, he loves you. And he wants to forgive you. He wants to, let me tell you, he wants to give you a fresh start in life. I had a conversation with a guy. And he told me one time, he goes, you know, Steve, this whole thing about Christianity is, you're just trying to figure out how to get the guilt off your life. I said, absolutely. I said, how do you do it for you? He goes, well, you know, guilt is really an external thing where it in, Guilt is based upon societal mores and customs. And, and if you change that, then you would change your perception of how you feel about yourself. And I said, no, 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 no. Guilt has to do with your conscience. You can change laws, but you can't change your conscience. The moral compass that God placed, that God created you in his image and likeness, the Bible says. So you and I have a guilt problem. What do we do with this guilt problem? I, I didn't know what to do with my guilt problem. But when I came to Christ, that guilt that comes from sin. First John says it this way. It talks about, in First John 3, 5, he, he says that, 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 that Jesus became a man so that he could take away my sins. What is the result? What is the result of him coming? Let me just say this. I'll close with this. God came to earth. He invaded this earth to demonstrate who he is to demonstrate that he has a plan for our life, to demonstrate, listen to me, that he loves you and cares about, to demonstrate what it means to, to be forgiven of your sin, what it means to have to be a fresh start, what, what it means. But let me, let me close with this. God came to earth because he wanted friendship with mankind. Friendship. Pastor, that blows my mind. All right, wait, wait, time out, time out. Like, I'm not in the Bible, man. That's like Moses. No, 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 no. I mean, yes, Moses was a friend of God, but yes, John was a friend of Christ, but no, 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 listen. And you can be a friend of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter five, here's what it says, for since our friendship with God, you can be a friend of God. It's not like the Wizard of Oz where this little guy behind this curtain and the smoke and this fire and he's back there and, he's, and then he walks out. You go, wait a minute. No, no, no. You can be a friend of God. <laughs> Why? We were restored by the death of his son. Why did Christ come? To die? To pay for my sin and your sin? To restore us into relationship with God? While we were still enemies, sir, I couldn't save myself. I couldn't pull myself, God, the gospel is not how to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Christ died for me because I couldn't die for myself and save myself. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. You know, I'll close with this short story. Some of you guys know it. I was, when I was, right when I was turned 19 years old, I, I was, my parents made me go to church when I was a kid. There was no option at all, but I would sit on that back row, just kind of just like, yeah, yeah, man, this is, bro. Just kind of listen to the preacher. And then I was a freshman in college, and I was invited to this Bible study by these two girls. I'd like to say I went for God. <laughs> I wasn't a Christian, remember, until after the Bible study. And I remember walking to that Bible study and all these people talking about being a friend of God. I remember all these people, they were so happy. I'm like, you guys are like so happy, like happy, happy, happy. It's like, what are you, it's like, wow. And then I thought to myself, what are my friends gonna think about me here? What are people gonna say? These are like Jesus freaks. <clears throat> these are like weird people. They're like too in love with God. Like, I know God. You're like, that's weird. I'll never forget at the end of the message, Chris is his name. Chris says, um, if anybody would like to receive Christ, um, we're going to bow our heads right now and we're going to pray this prayer. And I thought to myself, wow. Uh, and I just sensed the Holy Spirit. I sensed God's love. I, saw, I, I sensed God just, just so heavy and strong trying to just get a hold of my life because he loved me. But I thought this. I thought, man, I'd sinned too much. I'd gone too far. 
The second thing I thought is I need to change first and then I come to God. Let me say, say this to everybody. There's no sin you've ever committed that's too far that the grace of God can't wash and cleanse you. Number two, you don't have to change first. You come to Christ and he changes you and he cleans you up and he makes you presentable to God the Father. You don't change yourself. You don't change yourself. And I prayed that prayer and I'm telling you, man, it's like the weight of the world broke off my life. You can be a friend of God. You can have an intimacy with Christ, but you gotta open your heart to him. I'm gonna ask everybody to bow their heads. Would you do that? Then we're gonna sing our song. I just wanna just pray this prayer with you. If you're in this place and you do not know Christ, you're not sure about your relationship with God, you're not sure if you die today, you're ready to stand before God at all of our campuses. I'm gonna take literally 30 seconds. Pastor, pray for me. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. I can't save you. Church of the King can't save you. Your uncle who's a deacon at a church can't, he can't. Jesus saves. Do you know Christ? Have you ever personally confessed him as your Lord and your Savior? With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. I want to be at peace with God. I need the blood of Christ to wash me and cleanse me. If that's you, the count of three. Would you just lift your hand up high so I can see it? One, two, you know who you are. You need Christ. Three, just quickly hold your hand up high so I can see it all over the place. God bless you, buddy. God bless you guys right here. God bless you, ladies. God bless you, sir, back there. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. God bless you. God bless you, sir, right here. Anybody else up top? God bless you guys. Pastor, pray for me. God bless you. Anybody else? Let's just, let's just as we come before the Lord, can we pray with those that are trusting Christ right now? Can we just pray together? Come on, let's pray. Say, dear Jesus, come on, all of us. Dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Wash me with your blood. Forgive me of my sin. And I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life, and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. In Christ's name. I want everybody to look at me. If those of you that prayed and trusted Christ, let me just say this. Congratulate. Can we give the Lord a hand clap for that? Isn't that powerful? Let me say this. You live in another community, you need to find a good Bible preaching church. If you don't have a church and you live in our community, we'd love for you to call this church your home. All right, I'm gonna ask everybody to stand. I'm gonna need your help and we're all gonna need your help. When the ushers light your candle, would you turn around and help those around you as well? All right, we're gonna sing Silent Night together. I'm gonna be back in just a moment. Let's help one another if we can. Sing that again, John. We're going to sing it one more time, and Pastor Doug's going to release you guys, and I'll tell you, in the Bible, the Bible, Jesus himself calls himself the light of the world. Do you know the only place in the Bible where Jesus actually calls his followers the same things he calls himself is related to the light? 
He says, I'm the light of the world. Then he turns to them, he says, and you're the light of the world. Now, why am I saying that? You guys, some of you are going to go to parties tonight. Some of you are going to be with family and friends tomorrow and even throughout New Year's. And the truth is not everybody is doing well. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of stuff going on. And here's the point. You don't have to preach to them. I know this isn't right English or at them, but what we can do is just allow the light of Jesus to flow out of you. We are holding the light. Everybody say Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you. Don't forget that this Christmas season. I want to say this. We love you guys. Merry Christmas. We're going to sing it one more time. I'm going to be right out there. I'd love to be able to shake your hand and Pastor Doug's going to release you in just one moment. Let's sing it one more time. Father, we pray that the joy and the peace that you promised to the shepherds of the hillside the night of your coming, God, would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ and would fill our homes tomorrow with your joy. Father, I bless my brothers and sisters. I pray that you give them the best Christmas of their lives. In Jesus' name. Let's all say Merry Christmas on three, okay? One, two, three. Merry Christmas. You guys have a wonderful day tomorrow. Love you.